India's government says it will withdraw the special status of Indian administered Kashmir, ending the disputed territory's significant autonomy and putting it in direct rule by New Delhi. So what's behind this move and does it abide by the long-standing consensus? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I am Hashim Ahalbara. The disputed territory of Kashmir has been divided between India and Pakistan since their independence from Britain. Both countries claim it as their own and control parts of it. Indian administered Kashmir was granted special autonomy that allowed it to function largely without direct interference from New Delhi. But that has now changed. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Hindu nationalist-led government is now revoking the special status and sent additional troops to the area and put the region on lockdown. It's a move that could have widespread consequences. We'll bring in our guests in a moment. But first, this report from Priyanka Gupta. A sudden and momentous decision. India's government says it's revoking special privileges granted to Indian-administered Kashmir. The opposition is furious. It's a change in the constitution with far-reaching consequences. Using the powers vested under the third section of Article 370, following the recommendation of the parliament, the president announces that starting from the day the president of India will sign the declaration and the day when it will be published in the government's gazette, all the sections of Article 370 will cease to hold good, except for Section 1 of the article. Article 370, the section of the constitution that gives significant autonomy to Kashmir, is at the heart of why the region joined India in 1947. It allows the regional government to make its own laws, except in finance, defence, foreign affairs and communications. That means the residents of the state live under different laws from the rest of the country, in matters such as property ownership and citizenship. Now, the central government plans to split up the region into two parts, Kashmir and Jammu in one, and Ladakh, which will be directly governed by New Delhi. The government has put parts of Indian-administered Kashmir under security lockdown and has deployed tens of thousands of additional troops. Internet is blocked and phone lines are down. Three prominent Kashmiri politicians, two of them former chief ministers, are under house arrest. Revoking Indian-administered Kashmir's special status is expected to garner strong reaction. This is a, a, a straightforward uh, pandering to the, the Hindu majority electorate in India. Uh, the BJP or the Hindu Nationalist Party came to power in elections in May this year uh, with an enhanced majority based on promises that it would remove these special provisions which they say pandered to the Muslims of, uh, of India. So there is a, a clear political polarization here with the ruling party trying to pander to its Hindu vote bank. There have already been protests as rumours spread on Sunday about the government's plan. Article 35A and Article 370 is our basic constitutional right. We have made an agreement with India the basis of these articles. And now they are trying to derail or revoke these articles. This is an injustice to us. Kashmiris are not going to tolerate this injustice. Disputed Kashmir is one of the most militarised areas in the world. Both India and Pakistan claim it as their own. For now, the region is on the edge, as it prepares for what's to come. Priyanka Gupta, Al Jazeera. Pakistan has condemned India's decision and as Kamal Haider reports from the Pakistan administered side of Kashmir, there have been protests over the issue. Tensions are once again running high along the line of control that separates Indian and Pakistani administered Kashmir. The Pakistani military has accused Indian forces of using cluster munitions against heavily populated civilian areas which they say is against the Geneva Convention. Pakistan is also angered by India's unilateral move to change the status of Jammu and Kashmir. There have been demonstrations in all major cities of Pakistan including here in Mudafrabad, 
the administrative capital of Pakistani administered Kashmir. The Pakistani parliament is going to hold a joint session uh, on Tuesday to discuss this grave crisis. Pakistan has already held an important meeting of its military and civilian leadership under the auspices of the Pakistani Prime Minister. The message is quite clear that Pakistan is ready and capable to meet any Indian adventure. Pakistan also wants the international community to play its role in defusing this crisis because India insists that this is a bilateral issue. However, the bilateral uh, talks between the two countries have come to a deadlock and therefore international mediation is absolutely necessary in order to avoid a major crisis from spinning out of control. This is Kamal Haider for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests in London. Mirza Wahid, Kashmiri journalist, novelist, and the author of Collaborator and the Book of Gold Leaves. In New Delhi, Barkhadat, a Washington Post columnist and author of This Unquiet Land, story from India's fault lines. Also in London, Victoria Schofield, writer, historian, and South Asia affairs analyst. She's the author of Kashmir in Conflict, India, Pakistan, and, and the Unending War. Welcome to the program. Barka, uh, there seems to be a great deal of debate about the latest move by India and what it means. Is it fair to say that the resolution puts an end to the autonomous status that Jammu and Kashmir enjoyed for decades? Well, Hashim, uh, unless the Supreme Court of India uh, actually uh, has a legal interpretation that is able to halt this decision or put a stay on it, I think we have seen uh, the decision already taken. It's already done. It can only be undone legally. And that is now up to the Supreme Court if somebody indeed does challenge it. But the situation we're looking at right now is that an overwhelming number of parties in India's parliament appear to have supported the decision. There are only a handful of mainstream political parties, apart from the Kashmir Valley-based politicians uh, that have opposed this move. So, yes, indeed, uh, with this announcement, uh, the Modi government has withdrawn and has upended a 70-year-old policy that gave Jammu and Kashmir a special place in the Indian Union. It is now not just like any other state. It is, in fact, a union territory in which New Delhi will exercise much greater control and direct control than ever before. Mirza, the uh, autonomy and the special status was a cornerstone of the accession of uh, Jammu and Kashmir in 1947. And with this new decision, what would be the general sentiment in J Jammu and Kashmir? Do they see this as the beginning of an uncharted territory? I mean, it's both uncharted and quite expected because the, even within the constitutional guarantees in the Indian constitution, they haven't eroded over the years since 47. What has happened today is, is, is will have unimaginable consequences because you see what Kashmiris have often seen, the India's treatment of Kashmir as a colony, you know, and today is probably the starkest, starkest sort of, you know, display of that relationship that we will decide your future. We will not ask you. Not only won't we ask you, we'll keep you locked in your houses. We'll block your phones, including landlines and internet, and block your assembly while we decide your future in Delhi. There can't be a starker demonstration of India's callous <coughs> you know, treatment of Kashmir. And I, I, I see it as a grim, grim day because uh, not that Kashmiris were happy with the autonomy mm -hmm. that had been eroded over the years, but they have been waiting for something else, which is their right to speak. Today, Barkha Dath is right. There's large-scale support within India, within the Indian political spectrum, mm -hmm. so to speak, apart from a handful of voices and parties who voiced opposition, most seem to be on board with this complete sleight of con hand. It's a constitutional sleight of hand. They even within the Indian sort of scheme of things, this is illegal because they need the concurrence, is the correct word, of a elected legislative assembly mm -hmm. in Kashmir to endorse this. There is no assembly in place in okay. Kashmir. There is a governor in place right. who is imposed by Delhi. There is no legislative body in Kashmir as okay. we speak. Victoria, let's dissect the different aspects of this decision of this new resolution. First of all, he talks about revoking Article 370, which gives Jammu and Kashmir the right to make its own 
laws. Does it mean that now it's the New Delhi that will have the ultimate say over all the legislation in the future in Jammu and Kashmir? Well, as, as Mirza has said, made it very clear that um, the control which New Delhi exercises from, from now onwards will be much, much greater. But I think we've got to look particularly at the Article 35A and the property rights, because this is one of the remaining aspects. As again, Mirza said, the Article 370 has been eroded over the years, but what has remained in place is Article 35A, which means that the state legislature can decide who has right to permanent residency and consequently who can buy property. Mm -hmm. Now, if that goes, you've got any number of people from the rest of India feeling that they can come up and buy property in Jammu and Kashmir. Now, the Kashmir Valley is actually very small. It's approximately 90 miles long, 20 to 25 miles wide. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about the change of the demographics that will come into place mm -hmm. if you get all sorts of non-Kashmiris coming up wanting to buy land. This was one of the principal reasons why this article was put in place, mirroring what had been put in place in 1927 mm -hmm. by the passing of the hereditary state subject law. That's why the British had houseboats. Okay. They could not own land. So that's what we're seeing is a total change of demographics. Okay. Barca, so if you just come out and decide it's about time to uh, deny them the right to make their own laws in Jammu and Kashmir. And then you pave the way for non-residents to purchase land. Don't you think that this would stoke anti-India sentiment among the people in Jammu and Kashmir who would say, this is a land grab decision by the government? So I think that the Modi government, and I obviously speak as an independent ju journalist mm -hmm. and not for the government, but I think it's important for uh, your viewers to understand what may have driven uh, the Modi government to having taken this decision and taken it uh, literally overnight. I, it's been anticipated for the last few days. It's, uh, uh, we had, you, you know, we've had mobile and internet services uh, snapped in Kashmir, several elected representatives in Jammu and Kashmir placed under house arrest, no communication at all with the media. Uh, but, but the Modi government clearly Clearly, uh, from its point of view, is implementing something that its election manifesto has always said that it would do. It has long been the stated position of the Bharatiya Janata Party uh, that it would get rid of an article that gave Jammu and Kashmir this special status. Now, when you say have they lost the right to make their own laws, what was actually happening was that any law that was passed by India's parliament would need the approval of the Jammu and Kashmir Assembly. I think there's one legal question that's still a bit ambiguous for observers like me. Mm -hmm. Right now, there is no elected assembly in place in Jammu and Kashmir. There is what is called president's rule. So it is the centrally appointed governor who has given his consent instead of an elected assembly. Might India's Supreme Court take a view of this and say this is not legally valid? Other than that one question, uh, Hashim, uh, I think you have to understand two things here as mm -hmm. I uh, try and decode why did the sure. Modi government do this at this point. One, uh, there's 15th August coming up. I think the Prime Minister would like to make this the centerpiece of his 15th August speech. See, this is the big decision I took. I'm a decisive Prime Minister. I have a decisive Home Minister. I promised and delivered uh, what no other party could in, in 70 years. The, uh, the Congress party only whittled away, chipped away at 370. We actually got rid of it, one. Two, I think uh, the problem, governments take decisions when they believe they're politically popular. The, the, the point here is that this will have widespread support in mainland India and resistance within Kashmir. And so I think Mr. Modi is making a political calculation. And three, and this is something we should spend some time talking about, uh, this is, in my opinion, also cocking a snook at Donald Trump. In the last couple mm -hmm. of weeks, the American president has offered twice to mediate on Kashmir. The first time, India effectively called him a liar. The second time, India did not even respond. It is my understanding that as America, Pakistan enter their end game in Afghanistan and India fears the Taliban uh, once again in ascendancy, Pakistan having more leverage there than that would make that that would make Delhi comfortable. Mm -hmm. And Trump making that statement uh, totally antithetical to what India's position has been. This is also Modi saying something to Trump here. So there's a so whole you see some geopolitical of considerations factors, there. and we can discuss whether the way it's been handled is correct. Mm -hmm. I do. I do see both internal and external signaling. OK, Mirza, however, I mean, when you look at the, at the, at, at the decisions made, 
One of them is basically splitting Jammu and Kashmir into two federal territories, each with a state legislature. However, Ladakh will be without a legislature. How do you, how do you explain that? How do you see it? Let's, let's, I think we need to go back to basics and mm -hmm. basics of history here. Kashmir is a disputed territory. And that's not a matter of opinion. That mm. is a historical fact, which is also you know, uh, written down in the UN Charter. It's a dispute between India and Pakistan. And in my view, and in the view of many Kashmiris, the biggest stakeholders are Kashmiris, who have once again not been asked. Not, it, it, when India has unilaterally decided, decided the future of Kashmir, which is Kashmiri people, not land. So in my view, this is a brazen and daylight robbery. It's a theft. It is one of those classic examples of we've got power, we've got mandate, we've got a majority in the parliament, we will do as we please. And as I said earlier, the message to Kashmiris is unambiguous, is very, very clear. We treat you as an occupied people. And for all practical purposes, this is an occupying power which controls Kashmir via massive, massive military means. As we all know, Kashmir is the largest militarized space on, on, the, on the planet, the densest militarization anywhere in the world. So you can't possibly say, oh, we have some political calculations to kind of, yes, I, I agree broadly with, mm -hmm. with their point of view from their, for their purposes, they are just pandering to a Hindu majoritarian sentiment that has swept across India in the last four or five years, eight years now, probably. Uh, that is different. What it means for Kashmir is unambiguous disaster mm -hmm. and what it means for the larger region because as we all know Pakistan is a party to the dispute as this is in the United Nations Charter and Kashmir is at a party to the dispute this is not going to end okay. nicely this is not going to end peacefully okay. we I think Indian Parliament today passed a death sentence for many many Kashmiris who might be killed in the you know uh, in, in, in if there is unrest and further turmoil and this decision okay. will inevitably lead to more turmoil. Victoria is it a tactical move or is it a gamble by uh, Modi because when you look at the decision particularly when it comes to splitting Jammu and Kashmir into two federal ter territories however Ladakh remains without a legislature leaving many people to think he is trying to further divide and conquer predominantly Muslim areas and to deprive them of their own identity? Well, I think what you've got to think about is, is the objective. What is the end game? And in the end game should be peace and tranquility and prosperity for the people living in the territory. And um, much as you might have the bulk of the Hindu majority appreciating the move, what you've got is further alienation. The valley, as we know, is already alienated. And so if the end game is peace and prosperity, you're not going to get it. You're going to get further alienation from amongst the people. It's, it doesn't really hold very, very good to say, well, the majority accept this when the people who are actually affected by the decision don't accept it. And that's where I think Mirza has made the point that this has been a non-consultative overnight, so to speak, although we knew it was coming once the results of the election were made, uh, decision on the part of, of the BJP government. And mm -hmm. I'm afraid I don't see that it's going to bring peace in the region. It's not going to answer Delhi's um, uh, mm -hmm. ideas of integration. It's really going to create more alienation. And I think that will be very dangerous and will have repercussions throughout the region. Isn't this Barca something that could further undermine the democratic tenets of, the Indi of, of India itself? Because if you look at this resolution, the government cuts off internet and phone services, places local leaders in Jammu and Kashmir under house arrest, declares that public, the protests and public rallies cannot be held, to the point where you have local leaders in Kashmir declaring today, like Mahbuba Mufti, today India becomes an occupying force in Jammu and Kashmir. Hashim, I do, uh, I do think, and I, I went on, on, on social media to say this as well, that I did not at all agree with the fact that uh, elected leaders, including two former chief ministers, Mehbooba Mufti and Omar Abdullah, were placed under house arrest, nor am I comfortable with the fact that this was a decision taken without any communication. I'm, I'm a bit confused about why the same decision, and not arguing for a moment whether it's good or bad, uh, could not have been taken after, let's say, a month of parliament debates 
or a consultative process with different stakeholders. That said, uh, uh, you know, I think what, what we really have to look out for uh, is how this plays out on the ground uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I'm raising this question is because it's been unclear for a while in the last few years who's going to get up and speak on behalf of, of the people, in particular in the valley, who are the people who are going to protest against this. Jammu is not. Ladakh is going to be absolutely happy being a union territory. The people of Jammu are not going to be unhappy with mm -hmm. this decision. So we're really talking about the Kashmir Valley. Now, Mirza referred to the UN resolutions and to Kashmir being a dispute. That is not the Indian position. India is prepared to have a dialogue with Pakistan, but sees Kashmir as A, an integral part of the country, and B, something that has to be bilaterally resolved with Pakistan. What I do agree, and I think the troop deployment speaks to that, is that we are going to definitely in the short term uh, see a phase of, of, of turmoil and unrest, perhaps the line of control being inflamed, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, it's been inflamed for the last few days uh, between Pakistan and India. And I think the measure of success of this move, there I agree with Victoria, has to be that if you are going to say that, okay, outsiders can now come into Kashmir, no outsiders actually going to come into Kashmir me till the situation on the ground actually improves. Nobody's mm -hmm. going to go there and buy property and set up home if they don't feel safe doing so, right? It's so it. the measure of success of this has to be how the ground situation responds. Otherwise, it remains a change on paper and not a change that actually takes place. For this reason, I would like to ask Mirza about what kind of impact will this have on the local population in, uh, in Kashmir? I'm talking about the establishment politicians, about the mainstream opposition, and about uh, is this something which is likely to further radicalize people? Uh, allow me a few points. You see, uh, yesterday they arrested, put... Uh, so-called mainstream leadership under house arrest. These are people who manage Kashmir for Delhi when they're elected to power. Mm -hmm. uh, Delhi doesn't even trust those, let alone the large sort of mass of people who have never wanted to remain with India. It is not a matter of opinion once again. Time and again, Kashmiris have come on the streets demanding uh, that their right to self-determination be honoured, which was promised by Nehru in Indian Parliament, at the UN, it's listed in the UN Charter, so on and so forth, we all know that. Uh, the people of Kashmir do not want to be with India. That is a fact, and that is a fact that is, we have witnessed time and again over various decades of uh, political management by Delhi, conflict management by Delhi. Sometimes Pakistan plays opportunistic politics. It sort of raises the Kashmir issue only when there is trouble within the valley, so on and so forth. Uh, but the fact is the Kashmiris have not been asked, and that is, my, that is the main reason, the most important point. It will stay, it will burn, and what Delhi did today is they have further they have added fuel to the old to the okay. already burning bubble. I see your point. I would like to take it a little it bit to the. It will not go away. It okay. Will not go away. I would like to take it to the regional level. Victoria, do you think that this is something that could potentially lead to more confrontation in the future between Pakistan and India? You know, you, you've heard about the Pakistani reaction, which is basically considering this a violation of the international law and international resolutions. Yes, well, Pakistan was bound to make a statement given that it considers that it is part of the dispute and given also that it is occupying approximately one third of the geographical land space of the former princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. But I think you've got two issues here. One you've got is the relationship of the Indian government with the people living in the valley, the Kashmiris. They are the predominant amount of people, roughly six million people living in the valley of Kashmir. And then you've also got the situation of the more territorial dispute between India and Pakistan over where, if they're going to ever accept the line of control as the international frontier, because are we looking at the Indian government um, incorporating Jammu and Kashmir as an Indian, um, uh, as a, as a Indian uh, Union state, including Gilgit Baltistan? Hardly not, because Pakistan is occupying that. Therefore, they have to talk to the Pakistan Thank government. You. Uh, about where, what the future of the whole state is. You can't just chop it up into little bits. Thanks to our guests, Mirza Wahid, Barkhadat and Victoria Schofield. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashim Ahlbara, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.